Well, thank you uh, very much. Let me first of all say I'm very happy to be here on the occasion of this 150th anniversary. It's a real thrill to be with uh, an organization that's been around for that long. It's actually, as we all know, relatively rare. I would guess in order for a company to be in place for 150 years, they would have to demonstrate a lot of, a lot of integrity uh, regarding their customers and a lot of innovation over the years in order to last this, this long. So I'm very happy to be here. Let me begin, if I can, by answering the first three questions that you have. Uh, the answers are six foot seven. Uh, yes, I did play some basketball, that was a long time ago. And uh, I'll tell you the story of how I became a professional futurist. I did, as the introduction mentioned, come out of a first career in higher education but that was more than two decades ago now. And there is a particular story of how I became a professional futurist, how I came to ownfuturist.com. And I will uh, tell you that. How many of you have heard a futurist speak before at a conference or an event? Just a few. Well, I don't know what your image of a professional futurist might be. I know uh, one who's a demographer by trade. His name is David Snyder. He tells the following story as though it's a true story. It probably is. It probably happened something like this. David was invited to uh, Florida to participate in a strategic planning retreat of one of the international aluminum companies based in the United States. He spent the day with them, at the end of which he was invited to a party at the vacation home of the chairman of the aluminum company. From that party, he was going to go to the airport to fly on to his next engagement. So he got in a cab with his suitcase of clothes, went out to the vacation home, got out of the cab, walked up to the front door, and rang the doorbell. And the wife of the chairman of the aluminum company came to the door, opened it up, and he said, hello, I'm David, I'm the futurist. And she looked very surprised and said, oh, I didn't realize my husband arranged for entertainment. <laughs> and seeing the suitcase, she said, well, you must want a place to change into your costume. So she saw purple gowns, crystal balls, and somebody who would be there to forecast or foretell the future. That's a common image of a futurist. There are perhaps about 1,200 of us around the world who make our living doing this full time. Basically what we do is work with organizations who want to take a longer term look at the future than they usually do. And I'll tell you a story or two about that. But first the story of how I became a futurist. As a kid I grew up in southern Idaho. Uh, reading Tom Swift novels. I don't know if, if any of you are old enough to remember those. They were an early kid's form of science fiction. I was fascinated by pictures in Life magazine of big wheeled space stations. And I began dreaming of space and being an astronaut and kind of equating that with the future. Eventually I got too tall to be a, an astronaut, so I gave up on that uh, dream. But just by pure happenstance, I'm a junior in a small liberal arts college in Spokane, Washington, when that college hires as its new president this amazing guy named Dr. Ed Lindemann. And Dr. Lindemann comes to the college direct from the Rockwell Corporation, where his title was Director of Program Planning for Building Apollo. So he had been in charge of building the spacecraft that had gone to the moon. And he became the president of the college and over the next dozen years became a mentor to me, right out of classic literature about how to be a mentor. Already in the first month or two, uh, little articles or notes would begin appearing in my student mailbox from Dr. Lindemann, the president. I had a reason to get to know him because I was involved in student government. But a, a note would appear and he'd say, here's an article I think you'd find interesting. Or a year or two later, I'm going downtown to give a speech to the Kiwanis. Why don't you ride along? You might learn something. And over a dozen years, we had this wonderful relationship. And Lindemann was an amazing guy who had a belief in the power of vision to create the future. He had a trust that we could figure out what to do to create a more preferred future, his favorite language of all. He was always asking, what can we do to create a more preferred future? And he was a great one for turning a phrase for coming up with a unique way of saying things. And when I was invited by Brian to come to this Bueller 150th anniversary, 
I immediately thought of my all-time favorite thing that Dr. Ed Lindemann ever said, which is the following. If you don't go far enough back in memory or far enough ahead in hope, your present will be impoverished. And so this afternoon, I'd really like to start by going back in memory as we began the program earlier today, as we walked through that wonderful history of the company going back 150 years. I want to tell you the story of the Heemstras and their journey to America. Now, I uh, am first generation, really, in the, in the country uh, from Dutch parents. My mother came from Holland when she was 37 with her family. They headed to California to be dairy farmers. And she has an interesting story herself. We just celebrated her 90th birthday in June. So apparently this is my summer for celebrating very long historical events. But this is the story of the Heemstras. My grandfather, named Taka Heemstra, uh, in the 1890s was a small child in Friesland, a province of Holland. And he came across a postcard of Montana. And he began dreaming of coming to Montana and in 1908, when the last homesteads were available, he and his uh, new bride, ages 19, 20 or so, uh, got in a boat and they came to Montana, uh, which they believed would be the land of milk and honey. Uh, they came there to be dry land wheat farmers. Uh, they discovered that Montana turned out to be the land of rocks and tumbleweed, but, uh, and, and not so much uh, rain. And, but they stuck it out for about uh, 15, 20 years before they gave up and and moved to Idaho. So my father was born in Montana. And when he was 13 years old, he was known as the best big team driver in the region of Columbus, Montana. It was a very interesting time period for my grandparents to have come to America in that first decade of the last century. And then to live in Montana until the mid-1920s when they gave up after one last hailstorm destroyed one last wheat crop, and they loaded a truck with whatever they owned, and they headed for, uh, they actually headed for Oregon, but the truck broke down in Nampa, Idaho, so I was born in Nampa, Idaho uh, some years later. It's an interesting time period for us to remember as we think about the history of Bueller. We're not going back quite 150 years, we're going back about 110 years. But to look at that time period and to ask, what changed, what was going on in that time period, and how might it compare to our time period in history? Because my grandparents arrived in 1908, they headed for Idaho in the mid-1920s, and after they arrived in Nampa, Idaho, sometime in the late 1920s, I know that this is true, although I never asked them this question, my grandparents must have sat across the kitchen table late one night in the late 1920s and looked at each other and said, you know, it's unbelievable how different our lives are today compared to when we were little kids growing up in Holland in the 1890s. And for them, it was true that everything had changed. Well, not everything changes. People are born and people die and they need clothing to wear and food to eat and shelter to live in. So a certain amount of things about life stays consistent. But for them, when you look back at what had happened in about a 30-year time period, think about it. X-rays had been discovered. The cause of malaria had been discovered. The uh, uh, airplane had been invented. Automobiles had been invented. The factory had been invented. And the whole industrial uh, revolution had taken off. And so if you look at how things were made or how things were bought and sold or how we traveled or how we communicated, for them it was true that everything had changed by the year, oh, 1925 to 1928. And for us, we're living in a similar time period. And if we're living in a similar time period of change, then it behooves us to explore the future. And we might ask the question, why explore the future? Well, one reason is to anticipate paradigm changes, to anticipate big things that are suddenly different. A second reason is to see preferred future directions early. This mentor, Ed Lindemann, used to say, well, there are three obvious questions about the future. What's probable in the future? What do the forecasts say? What is possible in the future? What are the things that are, that are outside the boundaries of the way we usually think about things? What is preferred? And one of the reasons that you would explore the future is to discover preferred future directions. We usually label that a vision early. 
Another reason is to then take that image of the future, that preferred future image, and fold it back on the present so that we can see what we ought to be doing today. And I want to tell you three quick stories about people that I've experienced or situations that I've experienced where people have attempted to do these kinds of things. The first story involves a guy named Bill Gates, who we've all heard of. Well, in 1988 or 1989, I was invited. I was uh, still teaching at the college level, and I was invited to come and spend a summer evening sitting in front of 100 high school kids who were in a thing in the state of Washington called the Governor's Leadership School. It's a little bit like Boy State or Girl State. It still exists. Somebody told me the other day that they uh, graduated from this not so long ago. 100 high school kids come to a college campus. They spend two weeks in the summer learning leadership skills. And I was involved in futures or future studies and making presentations about the future. And I happened to know the director of the school that summer. So he said, well, I'm going to invite you and this guy named Bill Gates to come and sit on stools in front of these 100 high school kids for three hours on a summer evening. And I want him to talk about the future of technology. And I want you to talk about the wider future. So for three magical hours, I sat on a stool next to Bill Gates the uh, CEO and founder of Microsoft. When he was still very young, Microsoft had recently gone public at that time, and I knew who Microsoft was. Uh, I didn't know really that Bill Gates would become quite so rich and famous, but he didn't know that I would not become so rich and famous, so for three hours, uh, we were on equal footing on these stools. And I talked about the future of the economy and population and this and that. And he talked about technology. And the task was describe the technological world at the beginning of the 21st century, early in the 21st century. This is 1989 or so, remember. And this is what Bill Gates said. He said, well, he said, at Microsoft, we believe that we can anticipate the future of technology about three years in advance. Beyond that, technology changes so fast that we don't really know what it's going to look like when you look out 15 or 20 years. So he said, I can't tell you exactly what technology is going to look like in 2001 to 2010, but this is the world that I imagine, Bill Gates said. He said, I get up in the morning in my home, and I think, and I see a picture on the wall, and I think, Da Vinci, I want Da Vinci. So I say to the picture on the wall, today I want Leonardo Da Vinci, and all the pictures in my house turn into Leonardo Da Vinci prints. Later on, Bill Gates bought the digital rights to all these kinds of things. He built a company for doing this. And in fact, I'm told if you go to his house, he can in fact do that now. He said, now oh, I think I'll still be commuting to work. The commute won't disappear. But I'll have some time before I go to work. So I will go to my surround screen virtual reality booth. And I think I would like to go on a hike in the Grand Canyon. And artificial intelligence or computing intelligence, he thinks, by the early 21st century, will be so, uh, so powerful that you could program in Hollywood personalities and carry on real-time conversations with simulated people in the machine. So he says, I'll pick out two personalities, and I'll go on a 20-minute hike in the Grand Canyon, at least in our mind, uh, before I go to work that day. We haven't quite gotten there in terms of computing intelligence or in terms of bandwidth and those kinds of things. But years later, I would have people tell me, well, the thing about Microsoft is that they don't have any vision. They just sort of search the world for good ideas, and they buy them up, and then they control the market. And to some extent, that has been their business strategy. But I always remember that story of Bill Gates in front of those 100 high school kids on that summer evening in 1989 when people say, the people at Microsoft don't have any vision for the future. That guy had an amazing vision for the future. Some years later, he gave a speech at the University of Washington. And in that speech, he said, everybody should have a vision for the future, every business. And if your vision is a good one, it will meet the laugh test. If it's not a good one, it will fail the laugh test. And by that, Bill Gates said, I mean, if your vision is really good, if it's really something that's going to change the world, a lot of people will laugh at it and say, you can't do that. That's impossible. And I say, but the visions that have always changed the world are those that meet the laugh test. At around the same time, I was teaching a communications class at the, universe, or at, at, uh, Boeing, uh, at the co Boeing company. It was an entry to management communication class. And so entry level managers at Boeing were required to take this class. 
and senior management at Boeing decided, well, as long as we're requiring all of our entry-level managers, we should require all of our senior-level managers to take this class too so that they will lead by example. We've all heard that before, right? So this guy named Alan Mulally was assigned to take my class. And Alan Mulally was a senior manager in manufacturing at Boeing. Some years later, he became the head of airplane manufacturing. And then some years later, he headed off to the Ford Motor Company, where he is now the CEO as, at the revival of Ford. So I have Alan Mulally in my little communications class. Uh, he's the most charismatic guy that I've ever met after this Ed Lindemann, the space guy, at least. And I remember taking Alan Mulally aside in 1989 or so, and I said, Alan, if you ever want to leave Boeing, you can be the next Tom Peters. This is when Tom Peters was the most popular business speaker uh, in the country. But the thing I noticed about Alan Mulally at that time was that in contrast to everybody else at Boeing that I met, he had this tremendous desire to take a very long view. And just a few months ago, uh, as he completed his, what, second year or so at Ford, as Ford was beginning to become profitable, I noticed an interview of Alan Mulally in USA Today, which is quoted on the screen here. And Alan Mulally uh, is described this way, like the Japanese company's Toyota's famously very long view, Mulally wants to look decades down the road, not months. And that's the way that he operates. And to me, that's a way of thinking about the future. Every now and then, it behooves us to look decades down the road. And one of my all-time favorite experiences doing that is with the John Deere company. About three years ago, I got a call from the commercial division at John Deere, not the agricultural division. So it was not the ag people, the tractor people. It was the people who build the small lawn mowing tractors, uh, the golf course maintenance equipment. We had the guy in the room who's in charge of maintaining Augusta, or at least advising the people at the Augusta National Golf Course uh, on behalf of uh, John Deere. And their question was, what will technology look like? What will our customers look like? And therefore, what should we look like a decade and a half from now? We were taking about a 15-year view. And my favorite story from those people were the golf course people had bought a robot company in San Diego. And this robot company had a dream, probably still does have a dream, of building small, swarming robot lawnmowers so that every golf course in America would have these underground bunkers in the fairways. And at midnight, the underground bunker would open up and a swarm of a dozen little robot lawnmowers would come out of this. And in one narrow part of the, free, uh, of the fairway, three robots would go down. And then when the fairway, fairway got wide, a dozen of them would form up in a long horizontal line and they would mow uh, all the lawns. And that was a great dream. But to me, whether they ever build that or not was really beside the point. The task they had assigned themselves was to get outside the box of the way we think about our business by taking a longer term look at the future. So there are many reasons to explore the future. Let's explore it together a little bit. I want to ask you a question, and I actually want to ask this question seriously at your table. And I want to give you about uh, 30 seconds each, so that'll be about three or four minutes uh, to answer this question. What's your image of the future? When you think of the future, let's say five years from now, or 10 years from now, or even 20 years from now, what kinds of words or pictures pop into your mind? What is your image of the future? Turn to the people sitting at your table, and if a word popped into your head or a picture popped into your head, just tell the people sitting at your table, what's your image of the future? What do you think of? What comes to your mind? Okay, time's up, time's up. Very good. Now, later, uh, when, before I finish, there will be a, a, some time for questions and answers, at which point we'll have a roving microphone or two. But just holler out an image, really loudly. What's, what's one image that you, uh, that, that you heard or, or said at your table? Small government. Small government. <laughs> good luck with that one. Uh, what's another? Sustainability. Sustainability. What's another? Jetsons. Jetsons. Love it. The number, the most asked question of me as a futurist is, whatever happened to the flying cars? How come we don't have them? That actually is the number one most often asked question. What's another one? 
Genetically modified wheat, genetically modified everything. Okay. What's your image of the future? Now, if, for some of you like me, the picture on the screen might be an image of the future. Uh, to me, this looks kind of very futuristic. I know that in this country, we are in this room, we are mostly North Americans. And within that, mostly Americans, right? And if you don't get an opportunity to travel elsewhere in the world to Shanghai or Beijing or Hong Kong or Jakarta or uh, Kuala Lumpur or in this case Surabumbe outside of Bangkok, you may not get the degree to which the world is racing us into the future and we're not in the race. Uh, every now and then you'll read a uh, Tom Friedman column in the New York Times. And Friedman will have come back from Shanghai or Hong Kong or some way, somewhere, you know, land back in New York at JFK. And he'll say, in contrast to 20 years ago, when I used to fly from the U.S. to the third world, now I feel like I fly from the future back into the third world. This is a real airport, a photograph of a real airport, sort of by an uh, airport outside of Bangkok. It looks as futuristic as anything that a science fiction writer would ever create, and it's a real place. Here are a couple of happy people celebrating the opening of their airport uh, in the last year or so. If I was speaking exclusively to an American audience, I could not emphasize more the degree to which we're going to have to step up our game in order to stay competitive in a world which is racing ahead and investing ahead and thinking ahead and most of all believing in the future in ways that we find it very challenging to do these days. There are three obvious questions about the future. I've mentioned them already. What is probable? What is possible? What is preferred? And if you play with those three questions, you discover some lessons about the future. As I mentioned, I've been doing futurist work for about two decades now. And as I've done this, it occurred to me that what I essentially do, and when I'm working with a company or an organization, what I'm asking them to do is to try to listen to the future. If you listen carefully, the future will tell you what you ought to be paying attention to, some things that you ought to be doing, some other things that you ought to stop doing. In a sense, what you're doing when you're planning for the future is you're attempting to listen to the future to learn what it's trying to tell you. One of the lessons that the future tries to tell us over and over again is that the future creates the present. We believe that things happened in the past, in the history of Bueller, that created the present Bueller. And we know that decisions will be made this year that will influence the kind of future that Bueller has. But in an almost mystical way, the future works in the opposite direction as well. The future creates the present. How does that work? Well, this is a very favorite cover of Fortune magazine for me. It's an ancient cover now. It's from 1993. If you look carefully, there are three dinosaur shapes on the cover with names. And their names are IBM and Sears and General Motors. And in 1993, Fortune was seriously asking, have these three companies become dinosaurs literally in danger of going extinct? What was interesting about those three companies in 1993 is that exactly 30 years earlier, in 1963, the famous management writer Peter Drucker had named the three best managed companies in the history of the world. And their names were Sears, IBM, and General Motors. 30 years later, Fortune was Quite seriously asking, are these three companies going to disappear? Now, since 1993, each worked very hard with varying degrees of success not to be a dinosaur. It turns out that General Motors might have been rescued at the very last moment and now has a chance not to disappear, but in fact to flourish into the future. What happened to those three companies? They each had, well, a whole number of things in terms of management structure and bad decisions and competition from abroad and all kinds of things happened. But among the things that happened to them was they each had an image of the future, of retailing or of the automobile business or the computing business. And they each developed strategies and visions that would be successful in that future. Meanwhile, the world went somewhere else. Either before they noticed or much more likely before they took seriously what they were noticing. That is, in 1993, undoubtedly in all three of those companies, there were people saying, hey, wait a minute, the world's going over here. But the powers that be would respond, I've only got two years till retirement, don't bother me. 
or they would say, we've got an awful lot of investment sunk in the way we're doing things now. Let's use up that investment. We'll worry about this five years from now. Or they will say the evidence isn't clear. Or they had all kinds of excuses for why to ignore where the world was going. The image of the future that you have in your personal life, in your community's life, in your company's life, the things you're getting ready, ready for, the things you're afraid of happening that you're trying to avoid, the vision that you'd like to try to create, all of those images mixed together, and they give you very powerful clues over the things that you ought to be doing today. If you want to change what you're doing today, change the future. Change what you're trying to get ready for. Change what you're trying to avoid. Change what you're trying to create, and that will tell you what you ought to be doing, and in that way, the future will create the present. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, the future is not a mystery. We say to each other all the time, well, who knows what's going to happen in the future? The future is unpredictable. Nobody knows what's going to happen. But in fact, while it's true that the future is not perfectly predictable, and it's true that probably the most important thing that will happen in the next decade will surprise everybody in this room, including me, at the same time, there are very knowable things about the future. There are many aspects of the future which are not mysterious at all. We know the population is becoming older and younger at the same time, more diverse at the same time, while we see all kinds of dyna dynamics going on in the global population, which are quite obvious. We know that technology change continues to accelerate. There is no end to the acceleration of technology change through innovation. <clears throat> we know that the triple E, environment, economy, and energy are all intertwined in a very particular way right now and evolving in a way that give us all kinds of new business opportunities while at the same time they challenge traditional ways that we've done things. We know that we face an amazing challenge of food security in the 21st century, mostly just in the amount of food that we have to grow in the next 50 years. And finally, we know that we have the opportunity to create the future. Let's look at demographics just very briefly. There are several different demographic dynamics that are interesting. And I'm not going to go into depth on them. The young population, the fact that they are digital natives, the first generation to grow up with computers worldwide is interesting. The fact that in North America, and especially in the US, the population is getting more diverse is an interesting business challenge and opportunity. But probably the most interesting aspect of population dynamics, at least to me, is this one. We know that the global population is getting older. We know that the American population is getting older. For example, of all the people who ever lived to be 65 years old in the whole history of the world, two thirds of them are alive today. Historically, people lived to be 65 years old, but they were relatively rare. Now it's very common to live to be 65, and this is a phenomenon which is worldwide. If we look just at the United States, and we ask in whatever state you're from, what percentage of your state population is over the age of 65? The answer will be 10 or 11 or 12 or 13 percent, meaning that in most parts of this country, if you walk down the streets, about one out of every 10 people you see should be over the age of 65. According to the Census Bureau, in 2025, we'll have 27 Floridas. You might notice whether your state is on this map. What does that mean? Well, 20% or more of the population over the age of 65. If you want to see the future, go to Florida and look around. And you get some very interesting clues. Literally, the world we're moving into is a world in which, as you walk down the streets of whatever city or town you're from, one out of every four or one out of every five people you see will be over the age of 65. In Italy, it will be one out of every three people that you see will be over the age of 65. In some other parts of Europe, the phenomenon will be similar. Japan is similar. What's the most powerful demographic trend in China? The aging of the population. By 2030, around 25% of their population will be over the age of 65. It's a common demographic trend worldwide, and we vastly underestimate it. How should we organize everything when a quarter of the population is over 65? What does it mean for work? What does it mean for consumer demand? What does it mean for taxes? What does it mean for schools? What does it mean for transportation facilities? 
What does it mean for almost everything that you can imagine? What does it mean for the kinds of houses that we build? And so on and so on. And we have only now about 15 years to be ready for a time when the population is going to be this old. That's a very interesting demographic trend. The other demographic trend that really stands out when you're thinking about business is this one. If you look around the world, the next one billion consumers are coming online really fast. They're primarily in India, China, Southeast Asia, and South America. Even if they're relatively poor today, they're very likely to have a cell phone and to be therefore hooked up to the internet in the form of the cloud. And this one billion consumers is going to drive the global economy. This one billion new consumers is going to drive the global economy over the next decade or decade and a half. And it's probably the most important of all the demographic trends that are out there because it has so many economic implications. Technology continues to accelerate. I like this illustration. A desktop computer circa 2001 is the equivalent of a cell phone today, which may be the equivalent of something that you either implant or at least that you wear in 2025. If you look at the primary technological drivers of our time, information technology, biotechnology, nanotechnology, all three of those are very significantly involved both in the kinds of products that a company like Bueller provides and the kinds of products that you as a consumer of their products provide to your ultimate customers. All of you are interested in studying, I know, what's happening in biotechnology, what's happening with biological uh, uh, research in terms of seeds or in terms of crop sciences. What's happening in nanotechnology in terms of our ability to rethink fuels? Or what's happening in information technology in terms of our ability to communicate to our customers worldwide? Or in terms of changing our industrial processes so they're more efficient? And the good news about those three fields and their intertwining is that the scientists and the academics are all hooked up to each other in ways today that go far beyond what existed even 10 years ago and certainly 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And so the technology acceleration is likely simply to continue. What about the triple E, as I like to call them, economy, environment, and energy? Let's talk about economy, first of all. Clearly, the era that we're in is an era that I like to label the knowledge value economy, borrowing from a Japanese writer who wrote a book by that title. And it's characterized these days, in 2010, by these four dynamics, rapid innovation and technology convergence. The debt drag that we've created in the last decade. If you look at all the curves about the growth of debt globally and in the US over the last decade, we lived on borrowed time and borrowed money for about 10 years. And it could not go on forever, and it turns out it didn't go on forever. And it all began to come to an end in late 2007, early 2008. And now we, spend, now we face a decade in which we have to dig ourselves out of the debt drag that we created for ourselves in the last decade. That's simple reality. On the lower right, the global challenge and opportunity. I've mentioned Sir Vimby Airport and the challenges that we're getting from around the globe. But it's also a tremendous opportunity in terms of this one billion new consumers. How do you succeed in that kind of highly volatile economy? The secret is in the lower left-hand cube. It's what a product or service knows that counts. The winners of the next decade will be those who can put the most intelligence into their product, hire the smartest people to develop that product, put the most intelligence into the product so that the consumer of the product, the customer for that product, can get intelligence out of it. So that when I buy this product versus that one, I choose this one because it's smarter. It has more intelligence in it. I can get more intelligence out of it. I can become smarter by using it. I can become smarter by learning how to use it. One of the things that was very exciting in the opening presentation today was the story of the entrepreneur or the innovation contest within Bueller. Because that is an example of a company that's saying, we believe 
that the future will go to the smart. And therefore, we should ask in our company, what can we do to elevate the smartest people and the smartest ideas to the top and put them in front? It's what a, knowledge, it's what a product or service knows that counts. We live in a knowledge value economy. But this economy is challenged by the debt drag. And there are a number of reasons why we got into the economic fix that we're in. But one that's kind of overlooked that I like to talk about is this one, because it's kind of a fun illustration if you're an American. Uh, about uh, four or five years ago, my older brother and I went back to the little town of New Plymouth, Idaho, where we had grown up in the first decade of our life. And we took our wives to the house that we grew up in and took a picture of it. That's it. Uh, and I'll tell you a little story. We were standing there about five years ago. We had moved away from this town in 1960. So we had been gone for about 45 years. Hadn't been back there. And we're standing in front of this house taking a photo. Those of you from small town Midwest, small mid Midwestern towns will recognize this story. We're standing in front of this house taking these pictures when a woman comes out from a house across the street. And she says, well, my husband and I were watching you through the front window and he said, oh, just go ahead and ask him. So she said, I have to ask you, are you the Heemstra boys? We'd been gone for 45 years. But that's not the point of the story. This house is about 980 square feet, which it turns out in 1950 was the average size new house in America. It was designed to house 3.4 people, though in my family's case there were six people, there were four kids in the family. What happened to housing in the U.S.? Was it just the bankers' fault that we got ourselves in a fix? Was it just the Wall, Streeters, Wall Street traders' fault that we got ourselves in a fix? Was it just the Republicans' fault or just the Democrats' fault that we got ourselves in a fix? We all had a role in this little game we called, let's pretend we have more money than we do. Because while that was the average new house, this was the height of luxury living in 1950. By 1960, houses looked like this. And then the 1970s, they started to look like this. And the 1980s, like this. And the 1990s, like this. And the 2000s, like this. Until in North America, as we hit 2007, it was very normal in community after community, and certainly in the Puget Sound area where I am around Microsoft and Boeing and so on, to build houses that look like this, five to 8,000 square foot in size, to house an average of 2.6 people. And what we did was we pretended that everybody in the country could afford these houses when everybody knew it wasn't true. And we told the banks, create some really creative ways that we can all pretend that we can do this and sell them to everybody in the world. And they can pretend that we can all afford this lifestyle. And in the end, it all came crashing down. Until we live in this world now, might, it, might this be a possibility? This is from James Howard Kunstler. He wrote this in 2007. The meta cycle of suburban development, including housing and all its accessories in roads and chain stores, is hitting the wall of peak oil and peak finance. The suburban build out is over. This will come as an agonizing surprise to many. The failure to make infinite suburbanization the permanent basis for an economy will rock our society for years to come. It was a very prescient statement when he wrote that in 2007. Finally, on the economy, this is a really interesting chart. This is, on the left, the 19-teens to the 1940s. In the middle, the 1940s to the 1980s. On the right, the 1980s until now. And it shows the percentage of income that goes to the top 10% of wage earners in the US. Where does the income tend to go? And you see in the 1920s, it went heavily to people at the top. And you see since 1980s, it goes heavily to the people at the top. If you look at the middle, the amount of income that went to the top actually fell pretty drastically. And from 1946 to 1981 was when in the United States of America, we built the great middle class the greatest middle class build out the world has ever seen. And in fact, in fact, it created the modern world economy as we think of it. And then a whole lot of different industrial dynamics, global economic dynamics, tax dynamics, political dynamics, all kinds of things began changing in the early 1980s such that we began going back to the future. And until we can remake our economy to more approximate the middle of this chart, 
it's unlikely that would really come out of this debt trap that we're in. That's the first E. That's the economic part of the triple E. What about the environmental E, the climate change E? Well, I don't know where you are in terms of understanding that the climate might be changing. And it might be changing because of certain things that we're doing in addition to other dynamics. But if you want to pay attention to scientific data, here's a place to look. Every now and then, go on the internet, go to a search engine, type in snow and ice data. And it will take you to the Federal Center in Colorado Springs, which studies snow and ice data around the world. And in particular, this is an interesting time of year because in September, they will publish the map of the North Pole and show us how much is ice is left at the end of the summer melt season at the North Pole. Here's how much ice was left in 1979 on the left and how much was left in 2008. 2008 was the first year you could circumnavigate the pole in a boat in September. This year, as of the middle of July, we're on pace to melt the most ice ever in history since records have been kept in the North Pole which is suggestive of the possibility, I should say, the probability that the planet is warming up. In a certain sense, the planet is in the process of melting. Now at the end of September, it gets cold in, in the North Pole and begins freezing up again, and the cycle starts over again the next spring. It's just a very interesting piece of data to pay attention to, to tell yourself whether it looks like the planet is getting warmer or getting cooler. Here's another interesting piece of data from a non-politically aligned group called the National Arbor Day Foundation, which publishes a map to tell both farmers, but particularly people who like to grow flowers at their, you know, around their homes, what kinds of plants should you plant that would be cold hardy or hot weather hardy. And if you look at the Arbor Day planting map, you'll notice something interesting between 1990 and 2006. The cold weather is marching north as the blue parts of the map head northward year by year by year, all of which suggests that climate change might be something that we want to take seriously. And then that gets wrapped up with the future energy outlook. And the energy outlook is this. This is a map from the International Energy Association. And it's a fascinating map because the dark blue bar, which is really big in the year 2000, still pretty big in the year 2008, relatively small in the year 2030, reads as follows crude oil fields currently producing. That's the dark blue bar. Look at what happens between 2008 and 2030. The currently producing crude oil fields are in decline. The lighter blue bar is titled this way, crude oil fields yet to be developed or yet to be found. Notice in the year 2030 how much we're counting on oil fields that we haven't found yet or have not developed yet. And what have we learned in the last 120 days? That the oil fields we find these days tend to be more expensive to develop, more dangerous if something goes wrong, and therefore, in the long run, are likely to make conventional fuels more expensive. Not to mention, possibly, in the very long run, more scarce. Certainly more expensive, meaning that we probably need to start reinventing energy, like Heiner Gartner did in Germany, who saved the multi-generation hog farm by taking advantage of a German government subsidy to put in a field of solar panels on his farm and sell $600,000 of electricity per year from his farm while he continues to run his 1,000 hogs from which he pr produces biogas from their waste. I did have a Midwestern farmer say if he's making 600,000 year, uh, a year on electricity. Why in the world is he still messing with 1,000 pigs? But uh, that's, that's probably a whole other story right there. The point is, if you look at the economy and energy and the environment, they're all intertwined together, and they're all telling us that the next 10 to 15 years are all about innovation and reinventing things. Finally, there is the challenge of food security. Now, this company is primarily, not exclusively, because it's a very diverse company, an impressively diverse company in terms of all the products and services that the company is into. But primarily, you're in the food business and serving those who are in the food business. That's the majority of it. Look at the challenge for those of you who are in the food business. I just came across this statistic in the last couple of weeks 
as I was working on a report on the future of the economy for a state government. The global population is growing. Eventually, it might stop growing, but it's still growing today. We have 6.8 billion people in the world today. And even the most conservative forecasts by the United Nations and others say that we'll have about 9 billion people on the planet in the year 2050, 40 years from now. Now, if you look at what 9 billion people are going to need to eat between now and 2050, it means in the next 40 years, we have to produce as much food as in all of history up till now. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but you have to remember back in 1900, there were only a little over a billion people on the planet. Now we have 6.8 billion. So you've got 6.8 billion people eating every day, plus another 3 billion people eating every day. And if you add it all up in 40 years, the next 40 years, we've got to produce as much food on this planet as we have in all of history up till now. How are we going to do that? That's the challenge. It requires 21st century agriculture. It requires everything that we can think of about how to grow food in a sustainable way, in an economical way, in a way that will enable this many people to survive at a reasonable standard of living after the year 2050. That's the real challenge of global food security. In the end, preferred future planning is not really about the future. We engage in future planning because we think we're trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future or what we're going to do in the future. But you engage in preferred future planning not to figure out what's going to happen in the future, but so that you can fold that future image back on today and see more clearly the kinds of things that you ought to be doing or learning right now. If we review our lessons from the future, demographic dynamics, accelerating technology, the century of cheap energy coming to an end, dealing with a debtor society, being more sustainable in terms of environment and energy, and living up to the challenge of food security. In the end, we all discover over and over and over again that the future is not something that just happens to us. The future is something that we do. Bueller has been very successfully doing the future for 150 years. And my suspicion is that about 150 years from now, there will be a gathering just like this one. And we'll look back on another 150 years in which we have figured out how to do the future successfully. Thank you very much for having me here for this celebration. Now, if you raise your hand real high, I don't know if there's a microphone that is ready to run to you, but hopefully there is. I see it in the back. Uh, we started just a couple of minutes late. I don't want to get your other two speakers behind, but I can take two or three questions at least, and I will be very brief in answering them. So who has a question? If you had a question, what would it be? There we go. Here's one. Where in front? You can just yell it. How do I feel about nanotechnology? Of the, of the technological fields, information technology, biotechnology, and nanotechnology, I think nanotechnology is among the most exciting. Some years ago, I, I gave a talk to the, to the Die Casting Association, Manufacturing Association, which I know is how I ended up here. And in front of that group, we showed lots of pictures of nanotechnology and talked about nanotechnology. I skipped it today because I see that Bueller has quite a nanotechnology initiative going on. They have a whole division working in this ability to not just see atoms and molecules, but to begin to think about how to make things by operating at the atomic or molecular scale, literally grabbing, usually, usually using chemical tools, but grabbing an individual molecule or an individual atom and putting it together with another individual molecule or atom and making something that's never existed before, often making things that have unique physical characteristics that have never existed in nature before. If I was a, a young kid and I was going to go into a scientific field, I would want to get into this kind of large amorphous field of nanotechnology. How can we manipulate atoms and molecules to make new, unique, and powerful things? Using that technology, we can make things that are very tiny, like something that might go into your bloodstream and treat a cancer. Or we can make things very large, like a new kind of nanotechnology concrete that weighs half as much but is twice as strong and will last much longer than traditional concrete something that highway departments are taking a look at. So nanotechnology is an incredibly rich field. I think of uh, it as really the scientific endeavor of the 21st century. Uh, who has another question? One more. Yep. 
I, I got to go, go real loud because I can't hear that one. Oh, holograms. Yeah, holograms. What do you think the uh, hologram technology will uh, result in in the well, next I wish, 10 or 20 years? I wish years? I had my cell phone in my hand. Um, at the beginning of the year, I make a little forecast video, and I said, well, 3D is it. This year is all about 3D. Last year, I, I, I went to a lab in Southern California where I could uh, stand in front of a television screen. You can't see what I'm looking at, but it's like this television screen, except that it's all in three dimensions, and three dimension, you don't need any glasses. You can walk over here, you see three dimensions, you walk over here, three dimensions. It turns out that Samsung is selling in Korea right now a three-dimensional cell phone that, for which you don't need glasses. It, it's a little bit like the hologram that was in the Cracker Jack box some years ago. You just hold the phone at a certain uh, angle and a 3D image pops up out of it. And think of that in terms of, well, think of it in terms of maintenance or think, think of it for those of you who are in marketing and sales for a piece of equipment. Think of it in terms of selling a piece of equipment if you can send out 3D images for people to look at, or, or if you're in charge of maintaining the equipment, send out 3D images. Uh, Three-dimensional communication is where we're headed. Ten years from now, very little of what we now think of as an internet conversation or even a telephone call will take place unless it's video three-dimensional. That's where the communications world is, is heading. It's, it's, it's very exciting. It opens up lots and lots of possibilities. Uh, maybe time for one more, and then it's time for the MC to come back and, and uh, introduce the next speaker. If not, thank you very much for having me here. Congratulations on 150 great years. Thank you very much. <laughs>